Good evening, everyone. Sorry for the late start. Um, just a reminder that this panel is being filmed. Um, you'll be in control of your own microphone, so please make sure that it's turned off um, when you're not speaking. Um, the, there is no, I've had apologies from Councillor Hartley, Councillor Hannan, Councillor Salden, and Councillor Wynne Williams. Um, I don't believe there's any urgent business. Any declarations of interest? Nope. And um, then we'll go straight on to, to the main items on the agenda. Um, first up is Ellen Hadstead from Peabody. Better? Okay, fab, thank you. Uh, great. Uh, so, um, my name's Ellen Holstead. I'm from Peabody. I'm our Director of Strategy and Programme for Thamesmead. Uh, so, I work with John Lewis in our Thamesmead uh, Regeneration Directorate. And I'm just here to tell you a little bit about Peabody in Greenwich, what we're up to, and of course, a bit of a focus on Thamesmead, which is where most of our work at the moment is, is focused in terms of regeneration. Um, there's some detailed slides. I won't go through them all in detail, but the information's there, uh, should you wish for them. Um, so we have 5,900 units in, um, in, in Greenwich, um, spread across different tenures, about 64% of those are affordable, uh, which is obviously our core business as a housing association, a social landlord. Um, and as you can see, we've sort of included some of the spread of rents on there, and there's a good uh, degree of subsidised rent and good social rents in the borough as well. In terms of new homes, um, we've got um, a few schemes which have recently, relatively recently completed. Uh, we've got the REACH over in Thamesmead, which is a 66 unit um, development that was completed in 2019 um, and I think it's been really successful. Um, it's all shared ownership um, properties. We have um, a, a scheme called Vill Valley House um, and one called Greenwich Police Station. Again, these have already completed. And then we've got two developments at the moment which are happening in the area. Um, one which is in Charlton, um, part of our Charlton Triangle. Um, homes there, which is due to completion imminently now. Um, that's an infill scheme of 14 affordable homes. And then we have a working in partnership with Barclay Homes um, to bring forward a site over in West Thamesmead, uh, which is, um, I'll come on and tell a little bit more about how that's going um, as we, throughout the presentation. Um, but of course, our work um, in Thamesmead is much broader than just the development of new homes. Um, and again, as I say, that's where most of our efforts are focused on at the moment in terms of regeneration. Um, so Peabody finds itself in an unusual position in Thamesmead because of the range and scale of assets that we are responsible for. Um, so as well as um, a large number of social homes, we also look after about 240 hectares of green space, uh, so that's parks and canal and waterway networks, as well as about 15 community buildings. Uh, we have about 53,000 trees that we look after um, and a wide range of commercial and industrial spaces, which are obviously really important to the local economy. Um, so all of those things came into the Peabody Group in 2014, so we spent the last 10 years working in Thamesmead. Um, we published our plan for Thamesmead, which is our, which is our 30 year vision for um, how we plan to look after the area. Uh, we describe our mission really simply as to improve, grow and look after Thamesmead for the long term. Obviously, Thamesmead has a really rich history and heritage, and we're aware that lots of the area's potential has never quite been fulfilled. So our vision is um, really to see, um, you know, it has so many aspects of a great place, and it's really to see that vision realised. Um, the way we work is we, we call it a whole place approach uh, to regeneration. So that's very much investing in the buildings, but also the landscape, the green spaces, working with local people people and partners to um, create new opportunities across the whole area. Um, and a lot's been done. So we launched our first plan for Thamesmead in 2018. Um, and uh, I'll come on to some highlights in a moment. Um, but there's been an enormous, I think, amount of progress starting um, and momentum starting to build in the area. Um, we launched our next stage of our plan in 2023. So that covers the next five year period, which really shows our commitment to that long term approach. And there's a snapshot of bits there again that we'll sort of give you to look at there. Um, 
I think there's a lot, uh, a lot happening. Um, as I say, some of I think some of the really good stuff is we've we've built 600 new homes uh, for people, um, but of course we're also um, looking after different things. So that's about six new community and culture buildings have opened. Um, we have over 300 cultural events have been happening in the town. Um, lots of businesses supportive, creative people helped into work. Um, grants um, issued out to um, community groups. So a wide range of different things which have, which have already been taking place. So hopefully that shows the spread that it's not just about the physical side of things. This is a very much a holistic program um, that we're looking of absolutely driven by uh, the communities who live in Thamesmead and obviously our partners um, such as yourselves. The way we work um, at Peabody is managed across um, five different themes. Uh, so the first is all about town management, so that's the basics. Um, we have a large environmental services team that provides caretaking services and grounds maintenance in the area. So um, very much working in partnership with, with yourselves to keep the area feeling well looked after and cared for. Second is all about growth and regeneration, which I'll come on to. Uh, we look at landscaping, as I said, which is about improving the quality and uh, use of Thamesmead's really unique parks and open spaces. We have a culture program, which is led by our head of culture, Adriana Marquez, um, and community, which is around socioeconomic opportunities for people in the area. And I'll just bring some highlights together that shows you what's been happening over the last couple of years. So in terms of growth and regeneration, um, the largest opportunity in the area is around the Thamesmead waterfront. Um, this is a 100-hectare uh, site, um, which is wholly in the borough of Greenwich. Um, huge potential to deliver up to 15,000 new homes, um, subject, of course, to the DLR extension in the area. But that would also include a major new park. Um, we have been working really closely with our partners, um, and this was through a joint venture that we formed with Lendlease in 2019. For those not familiar with the area, this um, should show you uh, a plan of the area and its proximity to where we are now in Woolwich and of course the rest of Thamesmead. And you can see that the existing Thamesmead Town Centre is in the centre in the heart of this, um, this area. In 2021, we commissioned a new strategic master plan and vision led by um, Pryor and Partners, which is um, painted a really interesting um, perspective on what the new area could look like. Um, this has shown that we can accommodate that 15,000 new homes with a new park and a redeveloped town centre that will serve the area. But this is entirely dependent on getting the extension of the DLR crossing. There was a lot of really rich public engagement during the process, um, including walks and talks and events um, and a place lab that we ran in the town centre. And we also uh, worked really closely with the um, uh, Greenwich Council officers and councillors to develop this vision for the area. And as I say, this has shown a really exciting, new, uh, really exciting opportunity for the area. So good progress was made uh, last year. Uh, in particular, we hit a, a major milestone around um, with our partners at TfL and uh, Greenwich to progress the business case for the DLR uh, with the submission of the strategic outline case to government in May 2023. We're continuing to progress to the next stage of work and that will take us through to the spring of next year. Public consultation was launched um, in February this year it's a very positive response. We're, we're informed over a thousand responses have been, held, uh, been, been received and we think the outcome will be published after the mayoral elections this year. Um, as I say, we continue to have regular catch-ups with Greenwich um, Council officers um, and I believe there was a recent site tour with members as well. The really positive news that uh, £25 million pounds of um, uh, funding was allocated towards bus improvements in Thamesmead. TfL uh, leading the design and implementation of that, supported obviously by Greenwich Council and the, in the joint venture. And that project is due to be delivered by March 26. Um, and the draft proposals are currently being developed as we stand. 
And just to touch on, I think, some of the key challenges uh, for that area, I think that it is very much related to the pace of uh, developing that case um, and the political and sort of funding uncertainties that sit within it. Um, the site itself requires extensive infrastructure investment to bring it forward, so it all really rests on the, the progression and momentum behind that case for the DLR. But good momentum and positive, uh, positive uh, efforts this year. So beyond that, the um, second large site, which is underway at the moment, is the Plumstead West Thamesmead um, site, which is being developed in partnership uh, with Berkeley Homes. They're the lead developer on, on the area. Um, this is uh, works that are on site and are continuing to be delivered. Uh, so that will create, um, in total, uh, 1,913 new homes, 35% uh, of which will be affordable, and that will also include a 1.8 uh, acre new public park. Um, construction is going well. Groundworks and foundation are completed for seven blocks, uh, with the frame now significantly progressed. I must say, every time I drive past, it seems to be skyrocketing out of the ground. Um, main challenges remain uh, for everyone the same around materials and, and labour costs, um, as well as the risk around you know, financial robustness of some of the subcontractors. But at the moment, we're seeing really good progress with that. Um, council officers are, have been involved throughout the master plan and detail planning, plus the delivery of the section 106 um, requirements for that scheme. Um, we're also working closely with council officers around the linked infrastructure project, which is to enhance the public realm around Plumstead Station. Um, so that includes the underpass, um, and that's receiving 2.7 million funding from, um, from Peabody as part of that connected scheme. Um, and the designs are progressing with the team at the moment. So I'll just touch on it, three more bits of our work. Um, I'll say that's very much about the physical developments coming forward, but so much of what we do is about the wider, wider brief. Um, I mentioned before around Thamesmead's rather remarkable uh, network of parks, um, open spaces, canals and lakes. Um, so we have, as I mentioned, um, an environmental services team um, who are responsible for the day-to-day -day upkeep of many of these parks and open spaces, but we also have a dedicated landscape team who are working on improving the quality of them. Um, that very much is focused on um, enhancing biodiversity, uh, such as wild meadow planting, um, bringing in new um, opportunities uh, for volunteering. We have an urban forest strategy for more and enhanced trees, and we've brought forward things like uh, new community gardens. I think there's been six new community gardens happening. Um, so really exciting to see people out and using the spaces, and also for the um, the enhancements around the nature of those. Um, some of the real, really lovely highlights, particularly in um, the Greenwich side of Thamesmead, include the Tump 53, which is a nature reserve in the moorings, if you haven't been, highly recommend it, um, which is a, a lovely nature reserve. We do a schools program, which is fully booked, um, so getting young people there, training out to um, and out into the natural environment in their doorstep. Um, so it has an outdoor education centre as well. Uh, we run Making Space for Nature programme, which is again a community-led programme helping people get out and meeting different people and landscapes. They do lots of planting days and all sorts of other volunteering bits across Thamesmead. So that network of people open and active in the environment is growing um, all the time. I mentioned we have um, a very much a exciting culture program in Thamesmead. So we have a dedicated team, a head of culture, which is unusual for a housing association, but so important, we think, to this, to this area. Um, and this is a, a unique and really ambitious community-led culture program. So this is very much about finding local creative um, people in Thamesmead and helping support them to create uh, cultural activities in Thamesmead. Um, you may have seen the annual Thamesmead Festival, which is runs every year. Last year was attended by 8,000 people. Um, that's all organised by residents through the Thamesmead Festival Production Group, um, who curate and commission uh, the stages and all the acts um, that happen in that festival. So that's continuing to grow from strength to strength and is a real um, marker, in the, marker in the annual calendar. We also work really closely with other partners, such as the Greenwich and Docklands International Fa uh, Festival, um, which helps, I think, bring Thamesmead onto the radar as a destination. 
And that's on top of all sorts of other things which are happening, um, such as uh, we run filming, um, we, we do lots of filming production and all the income we get from that goes into a community fund which is then distributed in small grants for local people to use. Uh, we help support um, very community-led things such as the Black Culture Collective which is about grants making for um, the community in Thamesmead. There is organisations like Thamesmead Arts and Culture Office. There's a real rich tapestry of uh, organisations and people making some really interesting um, and exciting culture happening in the area. And obviously we work very, very closely with Greenwich Council. Things like the Christmas event that happened in the town centre was really popular, which was organised and led by yourselves at Greenwich Council. And finally, um, we have a dedicated communities team uh, in the area in Thamesmead. There are four main themes to what they do. First is around economic inclusion, so skills, enterprise and jobs. Second around children and families. Third around health and well-being, and fourth around community activities and supporting those. So there's lots of information <laughs> I realise on that slide, um, but some real highlights in the team. And a lot of this is done in partnership, um, particularly with yourselves at the council um, and other partners across um, across Thamesmead. Uh, so, for example, in the Moorings um, Estate, we're working on the Super Zones project, um, which has been really successful in bringing stakeholders together and improving um, improving outcomes for people in that area. Uh, we are working on Healthier Thamesmead, which is bringing together a health and wellbeing programme, particularly focused um, through the Connecting Thamesmead work on uh, tackling isolation and loneliness. Um, we have things like a cycle hub, we do um, positive steps, which is social prescribing. Um, so a real rich range of different initiatives that are having some fantastic successes um, across the area. Um, not least the, the Community Fund, for example, which I mentioned before, which is around small grants for organisations. And all of that continues across, across Greenwich um, and obviously into Bexley, where Thamesmead spans. So that is my whistle stop. Um, uh, I realise a very fast canter through everything that we're doing in the, in the area. Um, but welcome any questions or if you'd like any more details on that, just let me know. Great, thank you. Councillor Taz. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. And um, the first is how um, can you talk to us about weighing up the the um, these new properties you're looking at building against the maintenance of the existing. Obviously, the maintenance of the existing is the things that come to us in the first instance. So I just wondered if you could talk to us about how you try and weigh that up. Yeah. Uh, it's a really great question and very important at the moment. Um, overall, Peabody Group as a whole is absolutely prioritising the maintenance of existing homes at the moment. Um, and that has included a slowdown of some of our developments across the board, not in Thamesmead. Um, we're progressing with those, it's, um, particularly on the Bexley side, because that's part of an estate regeneration programme. Um, but we are absolutely prioritising the maintenance of the homes. Um, in terms of um, the asset management in, in Thamesmead, the majority of our work is looking at South Thamesmead, which is on the Bexley side, um, because that's going through an estate regeneration programme um, at the moment. But yeah, we're, as a whole, pro absolutely prioritising into asset investments. So that would include building safety works and fire safety works, as well as the day-to-day -day repairs in the area. Thanks. Um, I've got one more, if that's okay. Um, the infrastructure, is. will there come a point at which you have to slow things down in order for the infrastructure to catch up? Um, and, you know, how do you monitor that? So I think um, for the waterfront project, where that's most, most pertinent... Um, at the moment, everything is focused on getting that DLR extension because without that transport infrastructure, the site's potential can't be fully realised. So everything, I think, is at the moment hinging on, on that um, and that work um, before which we wouldn't um, necessarily want to initiate anything because it would significantly change the way that the site can be developed. So I think for that one, it's very much contingent on that infrastructure coming, coming forward. Um, the other active sites that we have are, are, are not dependent on that in the same in the same way. 
Um, so yeah, I think for the waterfront, it, everything is predicated around that transport infrastructure. Thank you. Um, from your work with um, Greenwich and with, with other councils, for example, Bexley, is there anything that you think we could be doing better here to help promote more, more development and more regeneration? Mm. Um, I would say from, a tem te from our perspective in Thamesmead, it's been really positive working with the council. Um, there's really good engagement, particularly on that that transport scheme, which is obviously a, a very much around driven by partners. So um, I think we've had very positive, very positive engagement so far. Um, it, it's, it's great to see partnership working across the two boroughs as well, because obviously Thamesmead spans uh, with Bexley Council and Greenwich Council, and we find it really productive working with officers in those sort of cross borough partnerships as well. So no, I think from our perspective, it's, it's been really positive and We'd hope that carries on uh, in the future, but no, very good, thank you. Great, thank you. And then just a question about um, environmental impact. So obviously you do a lot of good work with the green space, but in terms of the actual building and development, what do you do there to try and reduce the amount of carbon you're using when you're building? Yeah, we... Um work hard to make sure the new buildings are coming in at um, good EPC ratings of, um, I believe it's being above for all our new builds, so they will be en energy efficient, the new builds themselves. Um, the work we're doing, um, particularly in South Thamesmead around the new homes, is very much to make sure that they are more energy efficient um, new homes um, because of the problems with the existing buildings. Um, so that's very much designed to solve that problem. Um, and then we were we are looking at that sustainability strategy for the wider wider estates um, to see what we can bring forward at the moment, but it's very much focused on, on those opportunities at the moment. Um, new windows were put into some of our buildings a few years ago, which again has, has significantly helped some of the buildings but really were suffering. Um, so we did an extensive program to put those into the tower blocks in Again, South tempts me, but there's on the Bexley side, um, the Moorings Estate, I think, is doing doing okay for, in that regard. But yeah, I'd say from our, our environmental perspective, the biggest thing we think can make the impact in Thamesmead is around those green spaces. Thank you. Um, Councillor Asgar? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ellen, for your presentation. Um, you've described yourself several times during your presentation as a social landlord. These developments that are, that are happening now, um, such as the REACH, they're not actually, it's not social housing though. They've got a small, very small proportion of what is known as affordable. So can you explain to me why the departure um, from providing social homes, which Peabody has done in London for a very long time? Thank you. Um. I think it's a really challenging question in turn it, and it all comes down to the viability of the schemes. Um, we uh, particularly, um, apologies again to, to go back, but the, the South Thamesmead um, area where we're directly delivering ourselves, um, there is um, a replacement, all social homes which are in that, in that scheme. Um, that's been really important to us to preserve the number of social homes that are in that scheme. Um, in terms of the mix that's in the Plumstead West Thamesmead scheme, that's worked through with Barclay Homes, um, the developer partner. Um, I think there's a, a broader um, you know, viability challenge with social rent and affordable rent. Um, but across all of our development portfolio, Peabody is one of the top providers of new social homes um, within our development um, pipelines. So wherever possible, we make sure that that is social, social homes, as you say, as opposed to other affordable rent tenures like shared ownership. So it remains a priority for us and we maximize it wherever we can, but there are going to be constraints that we're working on um, across, across different areas. Thank you. Um, so Peabody took ownership of Thamesmead in 2014. So that's correct, isn't it? Um, and you're saying between 2018 and 2023, 600 new homes have been built. So that's 120 a year, which doesn't seem like an awful lot. Um, when Peabody took on Thamesmead, did you know that it was, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually quite sure at this point when it became a Mayor of London opportunity area. A lot of this is all resting um, on the DLR coming, but if the DLR isn't, all things being well, it will come. But if it wasn't coming when you took that on in 2014, 
what would be happening with this land. Um, and regardless of that, there is obviously a, a, a huge need for new homes in London. And if this is a, a, a big space of land, it does feel like a bit of land banking is going on. I've had quite a few conversations in this committee about sill levels and they can't go up to the levels that they perhaps could be at because nothing's been built on these areas. But of course, um, once things are built, the land will go up in value, but then there's nothing for the, there's no sill money coming out of that at a, at a, at a better rate. So can you help me to sort of understand um, the theoretical scenario of no DLR and when you took on Thamesmead, there, were, there was no DLR then. What, what would you be doing with that land if there was no DLR? Thanks. No problem. Um, so I think one of the main drivers for us in Thamesmead was, as I say, sort of realising that potential. The new homes obviously helped to address some of the problems that the town faces, which hark back to its original design. And part of that is connectivity difficulties. Part of that is a lack of social and you know leisure facilities and amenities. Um, and there is also then new housing and the, the other opportunities that brings. So it is really important to us to that that growth is benefiting existing residents and, and newcomers alike. Um, me the waterfront area, is the biggest opportunity, and therefore I think it would be, we'd be remiss to bring forward our perhaps smaller residential schemes without the opportunity to, to look at the whole opportunity, particularly around the town centre, and for that to be a new regional hub, I think, for the area. So I think that's why it's so important to us that that connection comes. It benefits existing residents, but it also helps to bring in the new amenities and get it to the ambition and scale that it can fulfill. Um, I think whilst that has been, um, that is a very long-term program and project, um, there is other activity happening. So we mentioned the 1,900 homes that are being built in West Thamesmead. I think if that were anywhere else, that's a, one of the major schemes in, in, um, in London, actually. It's, it's an enormous amount of new homes that are coming forward, and actually that's, that's been driven at quite a fast pace, um, particularly by Barclay Homes, who have progressed the construction well. So I mean, that's, that's, I think, a real positive for the area. And then there's the activity happening in South Thamesmead. So 600 homes is the first phase of the scheme, um, uh, the, the area there, and part of a bigger program, which will be taking place and is progressing um, over the next um, 10 to 15 years. Um, so we have the next phase of that, which is on site at the moment, which will deliver 329 new homes, and we hope that continues um, at a good pace. Um, I appreciate these developments always take time, um, um, and I you know, completely appreciate that. But actually, I think for, for where, where we're at, it's been a relatively good pace of delivery um, so far. Um, but very much, I think, for that bigger, the bigger area in the waterfront, it's, it's absolutely worth predicating it on that transport because that helps to fulfil the ambitions, which I think is very much what people in Thamesmead asked us for originally. You know, it's that... It's the, the stuff to do, the town, the leisure, the connectivity and transport infrastructure that will improve the existing space. So that's why we're taking time to, to progress that in that way. Thank you. OK, two more questions. Uh, the, um, the master plan, um, and I have seen sort of um, artists' impressions of this before, there's a lot, an awful lot of towers crammed into this space, which is really out of keeping with the original um, plan for Thamesmead. And I know obviously Thamesmead has developed and grown over the years and it's not all as the original bit around Southmere, etc. cetera. But um, look, uh, obviously Thamesmead was made with lakes and, and outdoor space. This is a lot of, lot of towers crammed in, creating sort of canyon-like streets, um, which is completely um, uh, sort of creating a sort of mini New York, it looks like, on here. I don't see where the houses are, and it looks like an awful lot of flats in an awful lot of towers crammed into quite a small space um, quite near the city airport as well. So um, 
is this the actual final vision for this area or is there any opportunity to perhaps scale it down a bit and I know that's probably not um, going to make as much money but um, I know you've consulted the community on it so perhaps they feel differently but to me it does seem um, a, a big departure in, um, in terms of me. I, I remember there was a Guardian article then it said that you're actually putting a new town on top of a new town because it was a new town and you're building an, another new town on top of it. Is that how you see it? Thanks. Um, no, <laughs> but um, I appreciate the point. I think um, particularly in that area, one of the things we've tried to integrate into the vision is that connection with nature. It's what makes Hemsbead very, very distinctive. Um, so you will notice that there is a large park which is um, on the in the area, and the idea is that every every building feels like it's integrated into that park, and there is so, lots of natural spaces in between. Um, I think a lot of that will come through the detailed design phases. You know, this is very much a strategic outline. It's it's a vision and and, and an early sense of what can be achieved in the area. Um, I think there's a, a benefit to that density because it gives vibrancy and it helps to support the other bits that come into that master plan around, um, be it from cafes and shops and, and all the things that we'll want to happen in that town centre. Um, but I think a lot of that will come forward as the detailed design progresses. This is a very much an, a first iteration of what that vision would look like. Um, and. I think that there is an exciting, really exciting chance to connect it back into the river is probably the biggest thing, to your point around the original master plans. I think that there was a lot of really good ambition in, in there, um, and some of that never quite got realised, particularly towards the north um, of Thamesmead. So I think with the new waterfront, that chance to connect it back into the river, open that up, open up access into the, to the Thames, um, and some of the other lakes that are in the area will be a massive part of the new, um, the new area there. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, my final question is, um, is what work is Peabody doing um, to contribute towards the flood defences in Thamesmead? Obviously in Greenwich we're a lead local flood authority. Um, you are, have the ambition to build a ma huge development along the waterfront. Um, is there any strategic planning going on about the long-term flood defences in Thamesmead? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, we're aware of it. We, um, we look after parts of the river wall um, in Thamesmead, um, which we are um, diligently looking forward, uh, look, looking after. We work with the Environmental Agency and, and obviously yourselves around that. I'm, I'm not sure of the detail of what might be brought forward as part of that uh, scheme. And I think it, it possibly might be a bit early days, um, but I'd be happy to check that with the team, the, with the joint venture team, and get back to you if it's something of um, interest or concern. Great, thank you very much. Um, just one final question from me. Um, I just want to check if you're an accredited London living wage employer and if you ensure that that is paid throughout your supply chain. Yes, we are, yeah. Great, thank you very much and thanks for the presentation. No problem, thanks thank very you. much, cheers. Um, next up, we have Georgie Manuel from Hyde. Thanks. Sorry, I only have one name on my sheet. What's the yeah, additional? Good evening. Um, Georgie's actually our, um, our public affairs and policy, policy officer. So we've actually got two people from the development team today. So um, my name's Stephen Morris. I'm the group development director. And Jamie Buckley, the regional development director for London. Great, thank you. When you're ready, just feel free to start. Yeah, thank you. Can I just start up my laptop? We, are we able to get our slides up on the screen to talk? Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Great. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. First, may I thank, thank, thank the panel for inviting us along this evening. Um, really pleased to be, really pleased to be here. Um, I think, as you hopefully know, you know, sort of Greenwich is the spiritual home for Hyde, that we, we, we as a housing association were started here about 60 years ago. The original founders of the organization sort of used to meet, meet in a local, local pub and work out how they, how they could help, help deliver more, more social homes. Um, I think, as we said, if we go on to the next slide, if that's all right. All right, there we go. Great, thank you. Um, so, you know, almost 60 years on, um, we remain committed to providing homes and, commu um, and communities that customers are proud of. Um, we've given an outline here of the 3,000 homes that we have in Greenwich, um, vast majority being social rented homes, which is our, 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 our more significant tenure. Um, we, we've looked to focus this evening on our redevelopment um, schemes within the borough. So if I just pass on to Jamie, who will sort of talk through the, the current projects that we have with you. Thank you. So um, we have a pipe, a live pipeline um, in Greenwich at the moment of 1,600 homes. Um, I'm just going to talk you through a, a, a couple of those, just high level. So Charlton Riverside is a development we acquired um, 10 acres of land back in May 2018. Um, we have got a hybrid uh, planning consent, part in detail and part in outline for 1200, up to 1,212 homes. And that includes a, a, an, an extensive amount of commercial space. This development will deliver 40% affordable homes. Um, phase one um, delivers uh, over 50% of those affordable homes in the 718 um, new homes being provided. Um, the scheme also delivers a, a multitude of uh, wider benefits that sit aligned with the SPD. And um, that includes local infrastructure, bus services and, and new roads. We're currently um, on site with enabling works, um, looking, work, working through um, remediation and demolition of existing buildings on a couple of the vacant plots at the moment. Um, we're working really closely with officers at Greenwich, both in the property team and have been over the last few years with the, the planning team um, to move this site forward. Obviously, it's very complex, many of you will, will know. And, um, and requires a, a collaborative approach to really realising its potential of the, of the opportunity area. Brook Hill is um, one of our regeneration schemes. It's existing site of 80 homes. They're in quite poor condition and the site has um, been subject to quite bad antisocial behaviour, fly tipping and, um, and issues with um, the, the, the actual structure of the properties themselves. Um, planning consent was granted in March 23 to deliver 254 new homes. 50% of those are affordable. Um, there's been a great deal of collaboration with the local residents. This um, opportunity went um, to ballot and got a positive um, ballot response. Um, currently on site again with enabling works and in the process of procuring a contractor to deliver the scheme. Kidbrook is um, one of our smaller opportunities and, and actually not a usual type of development opportunity for Hyde. This is a section 106 um, with Barclay delivering 140 shared ownership homes on um, the landmark regeneration at Kidbrook Village. And we've added this one in Creek Road is a, is a, small, uh, a small site for Hyde, delivered 26 new homes um, 100 per cent affordable with a small amount of commercial space on the ground floor. Um, this site is recently completed and, uh, and it has been a real success um, for Hyde and received really positively with the shared ownership um, occupiers. Just wanted to just demonstrate the level of um, engagement. So engagement for Hyde is, is a high priority for us when we're looking and working through new opportunities. Um, 
this slide doesn't do it much, much justice, but we, on, on schemes such as Charlton Riverside that we do in Greenwich and across other boroughs, we, the, f the first stage of engagement is actually developing a strategy to really highlight the key areas of where we want to spend our time and, and ensure that we are really getting to the local community that are directly impacted, but then wider than that, how we can bring the wider even more wider community back in to a particular area. Charlton Riverside is a great example of that, hasn't got um, really close residents living on their site, but it's got really key community groups that are very, very keen to see a particular type of development come forward. So extensive engagement with those local residents, with councillors, the borough, GLA, Port of London Authority, and the, and the list goes on. There was also a huge amount of engagement with um, the existing operators on the site, so the tenants, people actually working there. The scheme has to incorporate um, a, a significant amount of uh, redevelopment of employment space, and therefore it's very much a strategy to ensure that we're not pushing um, the existing tenants on the, the operators on that site out of borough, that we're retained where we can. Um, Brook Hill, another example, regeneration, obviously at the heart of what you do is engagement. Extensive, um, extensive engagement took place. I mentioned earlier we had a, a, a very positive resident ballot, steering groups, regular meetings, public consultation events, but it goes one step further where it is one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, with with the existing residents to look at their resident offer and uh, establish um, where people wanted to move on out of borough on people wanted to be retained in borough and how we facilitate that within the new development and in the meantime while delivery is underway. And, um, and, and Creek Road is an example of a much smaller scheme where resident consultation followed through the, the, the planning process. So I, th I think just just to add to that, you know, I, th I think hopefully we try and demonstrate that we, you know, we are committed to regeneration and development with, within the borough where we can. In addition to the specific schemes that, that Jamie's just highlighted, we are actually you know, actively looking to seek and, and find additional additional sites within the borough where we can where we can develop and provide new homes. I think we, we have two that we're specifically following through with at the moment. So so hopefully the, the, there is more to come more to come from Hyde in, in terms of new development. Um, with, with regard to our existing residents, you know, as, I think, as we said, we have about 3,000 homes within the borough. Um, it, I think, as, as you referred to with Peabody, we, we, you know, w the emphasis is on, on improving repairs, um, fire safety works, you know, environmental improvements to the homes, and we have an extensive program that, that, that our operational team is rolling out on, on those. In addition to that, um, and to help uh, work particularly with responsive repairs. We're cha we've changed our neighbourhood model or management model within within the borough. So we, we've we've now re restructured into a into a in, into a model so that all officers are now you know fully badged as Hyde. We, we have named individuals. We have neighbourhood officers. So as that rolls out and works with, with the residents, that should give them a more personal and more responsive. Um, and more accountable service and more visible. So again, it's not just from a regeneration point of view, we're also looking, looking to improve the service to existing residents. Um, and then the final slide that, that we've just added, added in refers to our Hyde Foundation, which is a charity within Hyde, um, where our, our team at, at, at the foundation specifically look to work with charitable causes within the boroughs. And we've just highlighted here some of the community partners that we're working with, with within, child, with, within the Greenwich, which is the Charlton Athletic Community Trust, um, Her Centre, and Mama to Mama. Um, so I think that that's... That, that, that's our presentation. Happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start um, asking a couple of questions about shared ownership, if I may, because you've mentioned that quite a few times throughout your presentation. Um, and I'm saying this as somebody who has um, owned a shared, shared ownership uh, flat in the past in a different borough. Um, how often do you find that people are actually able to successfully staircase um, as point one? And the second one is, as you're building more shared ownership homes, um, I know a few people have been in contact to say that 
The prices of shared ownership homes are going, of the new homes seem to be lower than in previous home, the previous shared ownership, and therefore it's becoming harder to sell on shared ownership homes, and has that been your experience? Thank you. Um, I'll probably take that. Um, uh, our experience, is, we, we do have a specific staircasing team, which do deal with, with, with obviously shared owners who, who want to staircase up. And, you know, I haven't got the statistics on it, but, but you know, we're not, we don't find any difficulties um, with, with, with people who want to staircase up. And in fact, even the option is always as well, at, at, if, if they want to leave their shared ownership home, that they staircase to 100% at the time of sale. So it's a back-to-back -back transaction. So we, we, don't, we, don't really, we, we haven't really seen any difficulties with, with actual people uh, stair, staircasing up and, and exiting. That, that's not, we've not seen that as an issue with, with, our, with, with our residents. Um, has it been difficult for people to exit by selling on their shared ownership portion to somebody else, or have you found that's been okay? No, that, that seems to have been okay for, from our perspective. You have not had any feedback of, of any difficulties with, with, with that. Okay. So, sorry, the second question, was that? Was that, was that? No, no, that, that, that's, that's fine. Um, in terms of uh, ground rent and service charges, um, I know that across London and across the country, they have rocketed um, in recent months with um, increased insurance and obviously building and maintenance costs and materials going up. Um, do you happen to know what sort of ballpark you've been putting up for the, the people who um, have shared ownership or own their properties, what the ground rent and service charge increases have been like? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that, that's more from the operation, we're, we're from the development side, Faye, but we, we could get that data for you. But um, yeah, no, we, we are fully aware what, when obviously we're looking through schemes that part of the affordability criteria that we look for when we're looking to take forward schemes, shared ownership and, and, and all tenures really, is looking very carefully at service charge as well, because obviously we want, we want to make sure you know, service charges, one, are affordable and two, you know, are robust and that we're not looking at significant increases going forward. So we, we do, you know, we are fully aware aware of the issue, we do try to manage it, but I'm afraid I haven't got any specific data that, that I could give you, but can, we can come back to you with that if necessary. That would be really helpful if you yeah. could. Thank you. Well, we can send an, an email follow-up. Yeah. Thank, right. thank you. Thank uh, you. Councillor Asgar. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Steve and Joan, for your presentation. Um, I have a question on um, your existing, you said you have five neighbourhoods in Greenwich, and I was a little bit puzzled. Um, the presentation said you've reduced homes in each of our patches by a third. Can you tell me what that means? Yep, sorry, that, 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 that just means it, it, we, we reduce the number of, number of homes that are managed by an individual management manager. So it's more an internal reorganization rather than a loss of homes. It's, it's how, how we're actually managing the homes. So we've reduced the numbers managed by individual manager so they, we improve the service that way. Sorry, sorry, not, not, not the best well-worded sort of presentation. Thank you. Um, on the, are you looking at any other sites in Greenwich? Obviously, you've got three um, on the boil. Um, have you got any other sites that you might have identified, or is that kind of enough for you to be getting on with at the moment? Yeah, so, so we are looking at a, a few other opportunities at the moment, but we haven't got a fixed position, so it wouldn't be right for me to disclose that. But yes, we have got more coming through in the pipeline. The schemes that were presented this evening are ones that we actually own and are, uh, and are progressing into delivery. But just adding to that, though, you know, we, we, we do, though, have an appetite to do more. You know, the three schemes that we're act actively developing within the borough, we do have capacity within our team to do more, both you know, financially and personnel resource. So that's why we are looking to do more, do what we can, really. Thank you. And my final question, is it fair to say that you're building to rent? You're not um, on your presentation. I saw, I mean, I, obviously, I know you as a, a social housing um, provider. Lots of um, affordable rent, um, some shared ownership, but are you doing any sort of on the private open market as well, or is everything, is your offer shared ownership, um, affordable rents, things like that? Thank you. 
So we do provide a mix of tenures across uh, mainly large-scale developments, i.e. Charlton Riverside delivers 40% affordable, so the 60% will be market tenure, and that will be a range of market rents as well as outright sale, and it will just, as the strategy develops, we will be looking at what, you know, the need is in that particular local area and what the take-up will be, so we'll leave some flex flexibility. We actually deliver a lot of 100% affordable schemes, um, and, but but, but, it, but for us, there is a, we, we really need to maintain a mixed, diverse community. And to do that, you need to have a blend of tenures that complement each other, as well as the employment offer and, and the commercial offer as well. On that, I just want to, uh, sorry, that's just sparked off a final question. Um, for instance, Charlton Riverside, will the sort of more premium properties, uh, and when, by that I mean the more expensive properties sold in the open market, will be the ones that are closer to the river, the 100% affordable ones or the social rent ones, will they, be, will they get the sort of, um, will they be positioned in, in different places? Um, and also for the um, affordable flats, do, would people, residents of Greenwich get first dibs on those? Thank you. This is a great question for me to answer, um, as I remember it on committee night. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to say that actually we positioned uh, a mix of affordable and private on all of the plots. So that meant that all of our, including our affordable residents, got direct views to the river. Yes, there are prime locations, some of the higher um, flats that do face directly onto the river will be private, but they, there is a mix of tenures that, that get the benefit of those views and it was designed in that way and also tenure blinds. And, and yes, that is built into the strategy that there will be an opportunity for local residents to um, get um, an opportunity to secure those properties. Thank you. It's good to hear. Councillor Dowse. Thanks. Just one quick question about the um, the three developments that you're currently looking at. The, the people who are, are living there at the moment, what kind of um, assurances are you able to give them about what will happen to them next? And are, are the residents happy with, with the, uh, what you, they've been told? Yeah, so the Charlton Riverside is, it's, it's existing, that when I say tenants, they're actually the um, commercial operators of the site. So, so yes, there are, there, there, there's a mix of views about the redevelopment of the opportunity area. Um, there's, we've done extensive work to ensure that there are, for, so that there are commercial units for them to move into in a phased, uh, a phased manner. So we're retaining as many as we can. We, we work through that as a strategy develops. Um, the regeneration site at Brook Hill, um, so that's the 80 existing homes. So each one has been negotiated with. We've got a re, we re-provide homes for the social residents to come back. They get the opportunity to decide, and they have done through the process, to move out permanently or move and then come back when the development is completed. And each of those have got an individual resident offer. The same with the leaseholders as well. So they, and yes, they're in, they, they voted 87% in favour of redevelopment. Um, so it's, it, we've got a really positive um, steering group as well that's made up of those local residents that are currently living on the site. Um, thanks. Can I just ask um, what, in your opinion, has, is slowing down development at the moment? Because it feels like things are sort of really stagnating, um, particularly over the last few years. It'd be good to hear from you what you think what you think the problems are and what you think um, Greenwich could do to help speed that up. Thank you. Um, if I answer, ask the first question, yeah, I, I've been in property development now for nearly 40 years, scarily enough. Um, and I must say that these last two, three years have probably been the most challenging in my entire career. You know, we, we, it's almost like a perfect storm for development, really, and that, that, that's what makes it particularly challenging. Um, you know, bill cost inflation is is one of the most significant things. It's been huge bill cost inflation, and then it's not just the inf inflation; it, it, it's the um, volatility of it as well, really. So, it, so it's very difficult. You know, so one, 
you know, you, your developments take years, so you're making assumptions on costs, and you know, several years later is when you're actually building it. And so we, we, we've had massive in, inflation to, to have to tend, contend with, and still risks and uncertainties because of global situations such as the re Ukraine war, which impacts significantly on materials. Now you know, we, we've got a global marketplace for construction, so that, 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 that's one of the big issues. You know, again, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a national issue is, is, is around regis uh, legislation and regulatory matters. You know, we, we've had so many changes recently, quite rightly, you know, on environmental standards and fire safety standards. But you know, all of these things uh, come in and uh, not, not only add cost, but they add uncertainty to developments because when some of these things have been brought in, this has never been entirely clear exactly what's required. You know, particularly, you know, for a good example, is second staircases on, on, on buildings. St still not entirely clear, even though technical guidance came out last week. So, the, the, so it, 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 I say there are many, many different issues which, 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 which actually are, 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 you know, are affecting development you know, globally, as, as you rightly say. Um, specific use with Greenwich, would you like to? Yeah, I mean, um, over the over the last few years, there's been some difficulties with um, sort of making traction through the planning process. That's been mainly as a result of complex opportunity areas where there hasn't really been a lot of focus or leadership in particular areas. I'm really happy to say that that has really um, improved um, recently, even more so with dedicated staff that's looking and, and really focusing on trying to drive forward delivery. And the support of that has, 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 has made a big difference to us. Um, we, th there are a number of sort of um, aspects where local authorities can help unlock developments. Part of that is, you know, working really closely with potential partners um, from a property perspective and then also sort of the, the wider um, collective highways and infrastructure just to try and unlock those developments. Um, and, and all of those are, uh, have been, we, we've noticed a, a definite improvement over, over the recent period. And that's a lot to do with resourcing, I've got to be honest. Thank you. Um, uh, one final question from me is just on the London living wage. So do you make sure that the London living wage is paid throughout your supply chain? Yes, sorry, yes, we do. Yes. Great, thank you very much. And um, thank you both so much for your presentation and your time tonight. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Bradley Smith from Osborne. Thank you. My name's Bradley Smith, uh, Construction Director of Osborne, responsible for the uh, town centre regeneration that's going on around you at the moment, the public realm works. I don't think we're responsible for the traffic today, so uh, apologies that you're a little bit late. Um, we were brought in um, as a direct award because we've done work before for Royal, Bunnage, uh, Royal Borough of Greenwich at um, a, a library project that we've done a few years ago. Um, the job was had kind of been let as three different design stages on three different sections. So it had kind of got into a bit of a muddle and it was the uh, levelling up funding that had a due date of the funding to be released. So you guys needed some help to kind of bring it all together and basically get it to a scheme that was actually deliverable. So we were brought in on a PCSA, really early doors, to kind of bring those three design teams together and bring the project to make it viable. So with a funding budget that had to be spent by a certain time, so it was actually quite a challenge for yourselves. And we had to work with you guys to basically make sure we were getting that cost certainty so that we can proceed to the next stage. So the team was really, really important. It was Royal Borough of Greenwich that had a scheme to a point that didn't work within your own cost plan. Had John Consulting, the employer's agent that was bringing the contracts together, and ourselves as a contractor, as a tried and trusted entity that can kind of give you some real-term knowledge of how to get that scheme off the ground. Uh, the way we done that was monthly client progress reporting, bi-monthly, uh, bi-weekly informal progress meetings, weekly comms meetings, which is really important to get the job off the ground. And as I said, um, shift statements of the cost and the budget as we got market testing in. Um, although not a huge value project compared to the others that have been informed me today, it's a 15 million uh, budget. The project structure is quite vast because there was a lot of stakeholders that had been involved in it 
prior to us getting involved. So it was quite important, and one of the big achievements was actually mapping that out and getting the right delegated authorities lined up to make sure that we weren't passing go without the funding that's been achieved so that money wasn't wasted in terms of value in quite a difficult climate at the moment. So that's why that slide was up there. Um, the project itself, like I said, each one of these three projects had their own separate design team and actually their own employer's agent working for each one of these. So I think that was done before our time in order to get it through various funding cycles. But obviously with that amount of stakeholders and three different designers working with three different EAs, it wasn't actually getting the whole ownership of the scheme. So when we came in, we basically brought in our own designers and Royal Burridge of Greenwich have kept your, the designers that you had as technical advisors and we brought our own ones in. So the scheme itself is Berryford Square, re-landscaping at Historic Market Square, Parish Street, which is resurfing the Woolwich Main High Street, incorporating new street furniture, and the Market Pavilion, which is a demolition of an existing toilet block, which is being replaced as we speak. So that's kind of a layout for those that don't know the project. Some visuals of us ongoing at the moment. And then the achievement and challenges. So it was a repeat customer being brought in as a Plumstead library. We had to really almost tear the scheme up and restart it again with that new project structure. The final cost had to be achieved within a challenging time frame. Um, the stage four design was complete, but it was, had lots of errors within it because of the different designers and different EAs, so we had to bring that together. And then the uh, market traders had to be relocated in terms of an early works package to allow the works to be able to start. Um, that's basically where we were and what I've gone through today. And the collaboration is completely clear at the moment with everybody, with public spending, it being right in the public eye. The scheme had only been done a number of years ago, so we were reducing and reusing a lot of materials. A lot of the councillors were brought in and we had uh, working groups, steering groups. Um, we've had to deal with a lot of state stakeholder liaison in terms of the shops, the residents, making sure everyone is on board for quite a difficult piece of work right on your uh, shop window. Uh, we started on time, the funding was released. We are currently within budget. They had to find more funding streams to allow the project to happen. Um, there has been a rake of uh, obstructions found in the ground because obviously it's in quite a difficult area and we've been open book with RBG and Hadron. Each one has been met, we've worked around it and we've actually changed the design Have we've been building to keep us on track. Um, and we have fortnight communication meetings are held with the Royal Borough of Greenwich and careful planning of the 10 individual phases of Power Street to make sure that we're keeping all the shops open, health and safety is to paramount. paramount. Um, we're also doing a lot of CSR and social value with the local community. Uh, in spring, we're going into a local nursery and doing external refurbishment to be undertaken by Osborne for a nursery. We've got local, um, the Gateman's employed from local community and we're doing a lot of work with retail revival and early engagement for all the businesses around Power Street. And it's a successful project uh, currently to date. We found a lot of archeological remains when we removed the old toilet block, which has all now been signed off. And that's starting mid-March with a finished date, at, um, uh, they're starting mid-April with a finished date of February. So we're looking on track and hopefully not too many issues. Okay, any questions? Um, Looking back over this period, what would you have done differently? Um, it's funny, I just make, met Daniel Stainsbury for coffee before we came in. Uh, employing a contractor, probably almost as a design in build at your stage two feasibility, to get that kind of actual uh, real-time advice, and then us appointing the design team on your behalf. So it would be yourselves with the vision and the stage two design, the concept, getting a contractor on board as early as viable possible to then appoint their own design team. So it's just designed once. It was almost in a situation that's been designed twice here because it had gone off into different work streams and each project was looked at individually. And that was what really was a stalling block for yourselves and could be improved going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, do any members, Councillor Dowse? Sorry, I did miss what you said. When is this due to be completed? 
Uh, it's due to be completed March 2025. And do you believe it will be? I can confidently say yes, yeah, I do. And on budget? Uh, probably not the original budget, but within your contingency, yes. Councillor Asgar. Hi. Um, Hi thanks, Bradley, for your presentation. Um, just, can you just clarify for me the role of H Hadron? So they are engaged by Greenwich... Greenwich as the contract administrator. OK, right. Yeah. OK, got it. They're contract administrator. Yes, they OK, are. fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you also confirm that you're a London living wage employer? We are, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. Thanks very much for the presentation Perfect. and coming in tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Okay, um, let's move on to Greenwich Builds. Who's coming up? Jeremy? Aidan, are you joining or are you staying back there? Raymond, where will I find the presentation? The down, down arrow, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, um, thank you. So I'm gonna just talk for a few minutes about Greenwich Builds. So just to be clear, Greenwich Builds builds 100% social rented housing for Greenwich uh, residents. And we were established in 2018. And that's when um, the mayor decided to think about building council homes for Londoners, which was a new program of council house building. And we put forward quite a strong proposal and were successful in securing um, lots of money, but more importantly, in um, getting the Conservative government to agree to raising the housing revenue account borrowing cap. And that was the restriction on why the council hadn't been able to build houses at scale for a generation. There was a cap on how much you can borrow on your housing revenue account. So in 2018, we kicked off Greenwich Builds from scratch, and the target was set to build 750 uh, new council homes um, and that was to be funded through a combination of GLA grant right to buy or, and or right to buy receipts and HRA borrowing. We also had some um, HRA capital as a result of the Woolwich Estates program and the Connaught Estates delivered more um, overage than was originally anticipated and we were able to use that capital as a contribution towards the Greenwich Build scheme. And what we did was look for sites across the whole borough in as many wards as possible and look at mainly underutilised bits of land, um, a lot of very small garage sites um, and, um, and so on. And also, uh, as part of the mayor's proposals, we were being asked to look at modern methods of construction and we were looking at using modular construction and there's quite a lot to talk about in relation to that. So we started the process and I think the reasons why we started the process aren't lost on any of you members of the panel. Um, the council's housing waiting list is over 27,000 people currently. Uh, of which about five and a half thousand are in priority need, so quite significant need. And again, as you will all be acutely aware, this year the rise in temporary accommodation and the pressure for temporary accommodation has gone up. Now, outside Greenwich Builds, we've had a programme of property acquisitions to deal with, um, uh, uh, to help house people in temporary accommodation. So we now own about 600 street properties across the borough. Um, but that we still got a massive rise in homeless um, and people in need of, of temporary accommodation. Um, and at the moment, there are about six, 260 uh, homes, families, households in hotel accommodation 
uh, at the moment and it's costing the borough around £35,000 a night. So really, really significant pressure on the general fund in year. Um, uh, although there was a budget of £5 million for temporary accommodation, I think the in-year uh, uh, budget was, was um, more like uh, 12, 12 million over that. So really, really significant problem. And the average property price in the borough is 13 times the average income. So it's getting harder and harder for people to be able to access the housing market. And rents themselves have gone up exponentially, which is what has created part of the problem with the, uh, the homelessness problem. And I don't need to elaborate on what the financial and human costs are of that. And I think it's, personally, I think it's gone from a crisis to being an utter disaster, and we're spending lots of money in the wrong places as a society. So, um, to respond to the brief um, that you set us, I just set out a few sort of development challenges. So, the first thing to say is the council hadn't built at scale for a long time. So, we did a number of what was called local authority new builds, about 30 every two years, and that was just kept us under the borrowing cap. And they were mainly homes for older people who couldn't exercise a right to buy. So, from 2018, we had to build a resource base uh, from scratch, um, which we've done. The other, <coughs> excuse me, the other really significant um, challenge uh, is the finance and the viability of the programme. So we had a very um, detailed business model, uh, as you would expect, cash forecasts, and as you've heard from colleagues at Hyde Housing, um, what were costs at £2,500 per square metre, we get some tender prices back now at £5,500 per square metre. So you can see what's happened in the market with build cost inflation. And it's not just, uh, as Hyde were explaining, it's not just the actual overall inflation there are some elements within it which have gone up by far more than the headline figure so we knew during covid for instance we carried on building but we had a real trouble getting plasterboard and the cost of plasterboard went up you may have all tried to do your own outdoor seating areas during covid the cost of timber went up massively so there's been lots of variations and volatility uh, in the period um, the other thing to say is we're building high quality homes to a net zero carbon specification. Um, so that's partly to help look at how do we address the climate emergency, what's our role as the council and fitting with our own carbon neutral strategy. And that comes at a premium. Um, and there are some other challenges around building at net zero carbon. One of which is that to build at net zero carbon typically um, you use timber frame um, and more recently the mayor has said if you're using grant you can't use timber frame so we've got conflicting issues in terms of some of the uh, the grant conditionality which has added some of the complexity um, planning we um, I think it's fair to say have um, all of our applications go through the main planning board and the main planning board has, in some cases, scrutinised our applications to a really high degree. And in many cases, given it's the council's own application, have started to request things that go beyond what would be reasonable to ask for a, from a developer. So, for instance, if we're putting two houses on, a, on an existing housing estate, some planning board members want us to you know, provide new play space for the whole estate, deal with CCTV for the whole estate, et cetera, et cetera, which makes it really difficult. Um, so we've had some, some challenges there. Um, I've mentioned and I've touched on the GLA grant conditions. So the GLA grant conditions have changed throughout the period since we started. Um, and there's much more of an emphasis on um, uh, concern about combustibility of materials modern methods of construction. But also it's, it's right to say that it's quite administratively heavy taking GLA grant. There are lots of um, requirements to do with EDI monitoring, but more than that, the constant reporting of progress and so on comes with quite a burden. So it's quite administratively heavy. Um, local uh, local residents and, and local objections, clearly we're building on sites often within developments that exist already. And 
we've had quite a lot of cases, and I can think of some very specific sites where it's been very aggressive and very anti-development, um, and it's been quite challenging to, um, to get through. Um, and I'll say a bit in a minute about how we go about consultation and some lessons that we've learned uh, from that. And then the other thing to say is we, we have some very challenging sites. We have a lot of small sites. And you might not know this, but a lot of them are garage sites. They will have been vacant and derelict for a long time. They'll be full of asbestos. And when people have exercised their right to buy a flat on a development, they have been granted access rights. And so we have to get into extinguishing access rights to garages and cleaning the title of the land before we're able to develop and build on it. Um, needless to say, we um, have raised our target from, one, uh, from 750 to 1,750 uh, homes. We are building at net zero carbon and 10% of what we're building is uh, wheelchair compliant and accessible. Um, and a larger proportion of family homes. We've actually delivered more of the individual homes and three bed, four bed homes than we have flats to date. And I'll come on to the, that in a minute. Um, and we've done it in, uh, across the borough, so about 75 different sites across the borough. We do commit to continuing to engage with the residents and we've got some lessons learned there, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, and we have done, particularly on larger schemes, so if we look at the brooks, um, we've done some play space and the play space has come forward first so that people in the community can begin to, to benefit from it. And we've by and large used modern methods of construction, although um, some traditional methods of construction are proving easier to procure and manage. Um, and we have had a number of social value outcomes in terms of people employed, apprenticeships, local people, etc. Um, but again, there's lots of lessons that learned there and things that we uh, look to do better as we, as we um, move on. And we've also done a number of homes which are specifically for people with uh, very specialist needs, such as adults with learning disabilities and so on. And as you can imagine, they come at a premium in terms of additional additional costs. So where are we? So we've, we, of the original uh, 750, 52 are completed and um, 696 of those are under construction at the moment. Um, so we've achieved planning for 770 homes. The phase two target of 1,000, we've got planning approved for 68 um, and we've got cabinet approval to start the feasibility on the uh, 25 sites so we can do the more detailed design uh, and so on. And then we've done a number of bulk acquisitions. So these are additions into the housing revenue account. So 265 uh, on the uh, former Morris Walk Estate and Marion Road. And uh, we've just recently completed um, uh, Greenwich Millennium Village purchases of 199 and a smaller site here in Woolwich at Sandy Hill Road. So overall, we will have increased the housing revenue account housing stock by about eight or nine percent which is really considerable since uh, 2018. Just a map just to show you where we are building um, across the borough and then just in terms of consultation what we um, have historically done is uh, talk to residents right at the beginning when we're thinking about a garage site or a site within an estate and then we move into a more detailed uh, consultation exercise as we're working up the plans. And then we hold a pre-planning um, application where there are 10 homes or more. And then, of course, our planning colleagues have to do their own uh, neighbour notification and uh, notification of a planning application. So we've had lots of engagement. We did lots of events. I mean, I've been to a few myself and a few of them were virtual on Commonplace, particularly during... Uh, COVID. What I think we have learned from this is sometimes we've spoken to people early and then by the time the planning application comes in they feel like it's been two years since they were spoken to and they don't know what's happened in between and they feel like we've gone back on what we said we were going to do. Um, so we're trying to shorten the process um, and engage at a point when we're clearer about the parameters. So what are the broad numbers that we think are achievable on the site and what is doable on the site. So 
I think we felt originally we needed to talk to people straight away. This was their estates, these were their homes, but actually I think we've probably shot ourselves in the foot a few times with that. We've gone too early with consultation. Um, and then I'll just give you um, a couple of examples. Uh, this is Thannington Court. So this was two three-bed homes on what was formerly just a hoarded off piece of land on one of our estates. And we've built these to net zero carbon and they're constructed from um, insulated panels, structurally insulated panels. And these were delivered to budget and on time um, and no neighbour complaints. I think there's a little video I can show you, which is just a bit of a run through of the, um, so you get a bit of a look inside the dwelling. Um, these are spacious homes. Um, and uh, I think one of the things, again, looking at the specification, you can see that it's good specification. Um, we, are constantly talking to our colleagues in repairs and investment about the specification of the homes and um, what sort of changes to specification they would require going forward so we're learning all the time and these are the heat pumps and the um, conductor systems for the um, ventilation systems for the warm and cool air um, So you can see they're fairly, fairly well, they're lovely homes and people have moved into them and seem to be really sort of delighted with them. Um, so a bit of a whistle stop. Um, oh yeah, home office with a nice view. I think these were something that went out on our Twitter feed or something. Um, so, sorry, I need to go back. So we, one of the things we do do is we... Um, follow up with residents when our housing colleagues have, uh, have assigned the resident to move in. There's somebody in the Greenwich Builds team visits the, the home and talks to people about their, um, how they find in the home and, and things in it. I think, again, you can see we get very good satisfaction ratings. Um, however, one of the things that we have picked up on is some of the environmental measures, like the PV solar PV on the roof and the air source heat pumps um, and the mechanical ventilation are a real change in the way that people use a house. People are used to turning a radiator on and opening a window um, and air source heat pumps are in super insulated homes meant to give a low ambient temperature um, and the mechanical ventilation takes warm air out, warm stale air out and exchanges it with cool air coming in, so there's a slight warm air coming in, but people tend to open the window. And that's when those systems start to become more, more difficult. We've had instances where people haven't turned the solar panels on, um, and then the air source heat pumps have been using the electricity and so on and so forth. So there's lots of lessons learned there, and it's about continuing to have a conversation. We've, got, we've developed some video modules of how to use the equipment, um, and we, repeat visits try and, and talk people through it and then there's just a, a, a an example of one um one home which was specifically a uh, this is at Ryden's close and this was specifically adapted uh for people in in wheelchair use so the kitchen um uh surfaces adjust in height obviously socket heights are at a different level there are hoists and there is a lift uh in the building and then here's another example of a scheme in, in Plumstead at Palmerston Crescent, um, which we handed over recently. Um, and again, these have been very well received. Um, so I think generally in terms of some uh, lessons learned, I think one of the things that's really strong is the council set out a really strong vision and leadership. There was a clear ambition about what you wanted to do, uh, which um, I hope we've been able to respond to. And I think as a team, we're very proud that we're delivering um, homes for people in, in need at proper social rents. Um, and we are delivering, I think along with Ealing, we're the uh, council that's delivering the most new council homes. Um, and the development at uh, Kibbrook Park uh, Road um, is one of the biggest single tenure estates in the country, if not the biggest. So we're, uh, we're proud of that. 
Um, and some of the schemes have been winning awards, although I'm a bit, always a bit cautious about those. Um, and we are setting the bar very high with the zero carbon, uh, which is adding costs. And we are dealing with some of the most difficult sites. So in terms of um, some of our lessons learned, I think I've mentioned some as I'm talking. I think some of the other ones would be that we were sold a bit of a dream with modular homes as being a solution. Um, being that most of the construction would be in a factory and then they would be brought to site and then it would be easier to construct them on site and you would have less um, contractors on site and so less disruption for residents and that has proved to be absolutely not the case. And the modular market is very immature and there are lots of small providers and we've had a number of them go into administration and that's been really difficult from a contract management point of view and then securing delivery on site. So I feel like we've gone with the information that we had reasonable expectation to go to residents and say, we will do this, and then some of the sites have been very badly delayed. Um, that's not to say they're not delivering and that we've got a program to deliver and where the contractor is not delivering them on time, they are subject to liquidated uh, penalties and damages which we do levy but it's a constant challenge and I think our lessons learned are probably modular is a really really tricky one to do and there are better ways the SIPs the super insulated panel structurally insulated panels is a better way of achieving zero carbon but we can't do those now under the new GLA grant regime so we've got some some adjusting to do but I think I'll leave it there unless you've got anything you wanted to add Thanks, Jeremy. Um, really great presentation, and thank you for being so frank about the challenges, as well as some of the brilliant wins um, that you've had. Um, just want to pick up on a couple of things that you particularly mentioned at the end there about the structurally insulated panels and not being able to use them for the GLA grants, and some of the timber frame that we can't use that either. And I just wondered what, what you understand the rationale to be there. <laughs> It's uh, fire safety. So uh, the GLA have taken a real sort of belts and braces approach and have essentially come to the decision that we're not allowed to use any flammable material in external walls. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, you also mentioned um, earlier on in the presentation that we have built more three or four bed homes than flats, which I think is brilliant. And then you said you'll come on to that a bit more later, but I'm not sure you did. Yeah, so we've front-loaded the houses and we've got a lot of flats that will be handed over shortly. So the first batch at Kipper Park Road is 133 and most of those are flats, so we'll start to get flats. But most of them to date have been the main the, the houses. Great, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Asghar? I thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> um, the qualification period for right to buy is three years. Have we lost any Greenwich Builds homes so far through right to buy? Thank you. No, we haven't. And um, we're, we're, we are aware that there is a premium that, that the discount that a purchaser can get is much less on a new home for a period so um long may it last thank you and some homes are being or have been acquired from the mayor's right to buy back is that correct and they're immune from right to buy Yes, that sits slightly differently, but you're right. So um, going back again, probably to about 2017, we started a programme of acquiring street properties to deal with temporary accommodation. And we acquired those using right to buy receipts and general fund borrowing so that the people living in them would pay rent that would pay back the borrowing costs. And then it, it was... It, was, it has been a successful, and goodness knows we'd be under massive pressure if we didn't have that scheme now. But you're right, the GLA issued a funding stream called Right to Buy Back, and we got allocated some money under Right to Buy Back, and we did buy back some 
former council homes which we use for temporary accommodation and they are not they do not have the right to buy um, associated with them thank you um are there any plans just on your street properties um that we own not necessarily on estates but are there any plans to do some work on those properties to perhaps extend them so for instance as a ward councillor you're often contacted by residents who've got a, a, a growing family, overcrowding, they need a bigger house. If you put a loft conversion on that house, you could probably gain two bedrooms. And it's a much more economical way than building a house from scratch um, to sort of instantly boost our capacity and our housing stock. Is there any plans for Greenwich Bills to sort of diversify into um, extending existing properties? Not at the moment. I think what tends to happen with the street properties is we, we do the acquisition and then they're handed over to housing colleagues to do the allocations and then the management of, of the homes. And they did used to have a programme which they had a, a capital sum available and I don't know whether they still do. I'll follow up with Jamie Carswell tomorrow and then I'll come back to you if that's okay. But they used to have a funding programme and I from memory, it was a couple of million pounds which was available for those people who wanted to do exactly what you were saying, who wanted to stay where they were but extend. Um, but I'll check whether that scheme still exists and, and come back to you if that's all right. Sure, thank you. Sorry if I've confused housing with um, development here. Um, and my final question is, you said the, um, the modular homes, you're not going down that route anymore. Um, regarding the Greenwich Builds um, properties that are currently under construction, what's their anticipated lifespan? And how, what's the average cost to build a Greenwich Builds property from start to finish? Thank you. Okay, so I'll start with the, I'll spot, I'll start with the latter, the average cost to build. Um, it, it's so difficult to come up with an average because each house is unique. And that's part of the problem for Greenwich Builds, is if we were a volume house builder, like a Barclay Homes or a Countryside, you would probably have six housing types and you would replicate that housing type. You might dress it up slightly differently, but you replicate the same housing type. And that's how they get economies of scale. We don't have standard housing types because we're trying to achieve zero carbon on very individual sites. So you might have solar panels on some aspects and not on others and, and passive solar gain and so on and so forth. So one of, one of the things that we're really aware of that makes Greenwich Builds as expensive as it is, is that we don't have standard typologies. But what I can say is the you know, we, we started off with thinking, well, it's going to be about two and a half thousand pounds a square meter to build. Um, and we've probably averaged, I would say, between three and a half and four. I have had some quotes back, some tenders back in the last few weeks, which are ridiculous. So we could be spending 750,000 pounds on a four bed house, for instance, which is just undoable in terms of what you can charge in rent and how long it takes to pay back and then the pressure that that puts on the housing revenue account. So I'm sorry I can't just sort of say an average. I think what we know from some of the acquisitions is, whether it's a bulk acquisition or whether it's a street property, we average around £380,000 for a two, three bed home. Um, but as I say, everything is so variable because nothing is the same twice. And then um, your question about the lifespan of the building. So they come with, with a full 65-year uh, guarantee, which is what we would get on a, on a standard build. Um, and um, some of the, um, we, ha we have an employer's agent who um, checks what's being built and verifies that what's being built is what we're paying for. And the quality is being good. So we're very pleased with some of that. And did I miss another question, sorry? Modular. modular. Yeah, I think the problem with modular is modular, the idea that 
it, you know, everything's made in a factory to precision levels and then they come to a site. It's great in theory, but those factories need volume and they need volume and repetition all the time and they just haven't had it. So you get people who are, what I would say, are entrepreneurial, they see the opportunity, they can see the common sense of, actually, if we could build more of this in a fa factory, it would be precision engineered, it would be easier on site. But the reality is they need a lot of space to make the modules, and the, one of the challenges is storing the modules. And then one of the other massive challenges is transporting the modules. So, you know, they come down from Birmingham or Glasgow on a lorry, and then they have to be craned in often to what are really challenging small sites. And where Modular has been successful is on some much larger sites where they've been able to have the replication. And that's what's proved so difficult. Can I just ask a couple of follow-up questions based on an answer that was just given? Is that all right? Thank you. Um, uh, standard typologies, would we be looking at, at, at utilising that ourselves and would you look at putting some standard typologies in place in order to benefit for some, from some economies of scale? Yes, uh, yeah. I think one of the things that we, I was talking to Councillor Smith today, one of the things that we've, we've obviously got a bit of a mixed market. So developers provide some homes for market sale, housing associations, registered providers do a combination. Um, and we're providing um, social homes and we're finding at the moment to do some bulk acquisitions is cheaper than designing something and tendering it. Um, and so one of the things I was talking to Councillor Smith about was the need to have a good look ahead and say over the next five to ten years we need a model of what we're doing and are we going to keep Greenwich Builds the same as it is now or do we do more acquisition? Um, and if we were to keep an element of Greenwich Builds, which is useful because when the market stops delivering homes, and as you heard, the market has had a really difficult time, it's good that we have control and we can still deliver some homes. Um, but we would probably focus on sites with a minimum size and sites where we could replicate the typology to bring the cost down and really look at the unit cost in more detail. So we would move to a much more commercial model. And I think those are the conversations I'm having with the team at the moment about how do we shape that in the future. Um, Jeremy, the, um, <clears throat> on the, um, again, on the, uh, the standard typologies, Back in the glory days of council house building, there was a borough architect or borough architects. Would it be, considering the scale of the ambition of Greenwich Builds, would it be sensible to try and look at maybe engaging some in-house borough architects to design our stock? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really interesting suggestion, actually, because I, I agree with you. I think that was a really valuable time in, in, in municipal life and um, architects were proud to work for a borough and deliver something really special and we go out to tender for architects um, and we try and use local architects where possible um, in accordance with the sort of social value and trying to keep, keep the local economy um, you know, in business. Um, but I think we're, you know, thinking back, we, you know, we've had quite a program. We could have justified an architect to produce the information. Um, and so, yeah, it is something that's worth thinking about. Of course, once you've employed somebody and they're in, they need a pipeline of work as well. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're, we're into a situation where actually it's better to just do tenders. But yeah, I, I understand the point. Thank you, Jeremy, which leads me on to my final question. And that is... Um, the cap on borrowing on the housing revenue account was um, lowered some time ago, but uh, the current government have um, recently, I think, hired it again. So how is that going to affect Greenwich Builds? So they, the housing revenue account has got different rules to the general fund within the council. 
and as you say there was a cap on what count, how much councils could borrow which was really limiting for Greenwich and it was even more limiting in the sense that um, there were rent restrictions so it couldn't even achieve more revenue um, which is which placed unfair disadvantage on, and that there was a very clear political driver to stop councils building and allow housing associations and RPs to build instead. Theresa May announced the raising of the borrowing cap and that enabled Greenwich to look to borrow an additional around £800 million from memory and a decision was taken by members to split that about 50-50 on new build and about 50% on repairs and investment of existing stock. And what we're doing at the moment, and I was talking to Councillor Smith about, is looking at saying, well, if, we're, if we've increased the HRA by 8%, does the council want to continue to increase its HRA, or does it want to start to say, well, there are some parts of our portfolio which are so poor and we're throwing such a lot of money after repairing it that actually we'd rather regenerate it or do a mixed market of some market sale or some discount market rent product or so on. So that's quite a big strategic question which we need to grapple with. So in short, the answer was the borrowing, the change to the borrowing cap released an additional 800 million and it was broadly split 400 million for new build and 400 million for repairs and investment. It hasn't been raised since. We're, we're limited on how much we can borrow by a number of factors, including the value of our existing stock um, and the rental return that our existing stock gives us. So we do an annual valuation of the housing. Um, and so you can only do a multiple of, of, uh, of what your income is. And of course, as I say, government has been very tight in terms of, of, of rental increases. And we've got the building safety things to repair and invest and respond to as well. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dowse? Um, <clears throat> we're very fortunate that um, hopefully we might be able to get a Greenwich build in our ward. The, the problem, I, I just wondered, immediately next door to where that development is, is one of the trickier um, blocks in the ward and I just wondered about the relationship between the people who are living in the existing homes looking at the lovely new homes that are going up next door and how we're going to manage that. I think that's a brilliant question and it's a really really challenging one. We've I've actually got a member of staff who lives in an older council house who looks out on a new one and says it's really unfair because they don't treat it very well and we would really look at you can imagine and that's i'm sure what you hear all the time and i i think again this comes to the question of the you know we we went from a standing start quite quickly to try and build some council homes to meet the need i think moving forward what we're talking about is we need to think more holistically about neighborhoods and think about where there are estates where the stock is poor quality then think about estate regeneration and and do it in a phased way so residents get the benefit they stay where they are they can move into new property and that's we we had a cabinet paper a couple of months ago probably weeks ago i can't remember um about housing our greenwich going forward and that was looking at very much about saying we need to think about estate renewal um, and I do think that one of the things that is really difficult is everybody pays the same service charge and people, you know, that there isn't a great deal of work that goes into the sort of mixing the new residents with the older residents and so on. So it's a really good point. I, I would say that um, there's an example from East Greenwich as well, where we've started a, a Greenwich Builds project and the residents of a neighbouring block have pointed out how tired looking their block is. And, and it's largely actually superficial. It's, it's kind of paint flaking off the uh, sort of wooden panelling. Um, but part of the repairs and investment fund, they've, for example, reintroduced an external decorations budget, which I don't believe housing have had for probably a decade or, or more. So 
so we are sensitive to that and and you, you're right, it is leading to, to those questions, but combined with the, with the repairs and investment, hopefully we can um, do something for those residents as well. Um, I just wonder if there's a recommendation we could put forward on the basis of that, because I think it was a really good point that you've raised, and it seems that it's sort of being considered, but I don't know, when you're looking at a new Greenwich build, if there is some sort of questions that can go into the the formulation of the plan that specifically looks at other properties within that immediate vicinity and a bit of a strategy to deal with those issues because I think it's a really important point and we've all got the anecdotes right and it might be something that we need to look into more specifically um, and I'm not sure exactly what your processes are but it would be kind of weaving in a couple of questions I don't know into the pro forma that you do when you're first setting out the plan or does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a really good recommendation. I think going back to 2018 when we kicked it off, I think we probably had that as part of the original performer. Um, but I think that's a really good recommendation. I think it's something we should really look harder at about me talking to Richard Parkin in repairs and investment and, and say, right, I'm now thinking about promoting this scheme in wherever. What repairs and investment work have you got going on and can we do it in tandem? with what's happening on Greenwich Build. I think that's a great suggestion. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, my second question might not be such a great suggestion. <laughs> I think I've been watching too many property shows. <laughs> um, is there any plans to build Greenwich Builds on industrial sites or old shop sites rather than within uh, existing neighbourhoods? Well, the, not at the moment. The, the, one, the one that was a vacant site, formerly a school site, was um, Kibbrook Park Road at um, what was Thomas Tallis School originally. So that was a, a brownfield site. Um, and you do raise a really important question because there are other sites that the council owns in the general fund, for instance, in Charlton Riverside, um, where we might say, where we've got industrial estates at the moment, where we might say actually the future is residential, not industrial. Um, and as part of the Charlton Riverside work, we might say, well, actually, yeah, that, that is, those are good sites for, um, for changing. And in fact, um, you know, we, we've got other sites where we've looked at where, you know, garage sites are fairly brownfield sites as well. And, um, but I can think of one or two other industrial sites that are coming to the end of their um, useful life in terms of us letting them. They won't meet the current energy performance certificate standards for re-letting them. And therefore, it's a legitimate question to think, well, actually, should we turn them into Greenwich builds as opposed to keeping them... Um, uh, for industrial use. Um, there are lots of intricacies around that because uh, industrial estate is, it sits in the general fund and housing sits in the housing revenue account and you need to appropriate from one to the other and you need a brain bigger than mine to be able to work out what the financial implications are. But it's not, it's not, it's, that's not a no, that's just another thing that we would have to consider when we were doing it. And if you've got any suggestions for any sites, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sullivan. Uh, swirling around in my head. Um, but before I make that, I just wanted to congratulate you on the, the programme that you've achieved in over these years. And I think we're actually quite fortunate in the borough. There is some a lot of work going on, whereas uh, colleagues in other boroughs are pretty disappointed about the act activity by their own but and also by the various developers. I think we're quite, quite uh, well blessed actually in, in Greenwich. Um, a couple of small questions, I think you pass that on to your team. The, what I, what I um, wanted to, um, a simple question, when is the Kippert Park Road scheme due to be completed uh, and occupied? I that's so phase one will hand over in September of this year. So 133 in September of this year. Okay. So they're just the scaffolding's coming down, the internal decorations happening, and we've got a phase letting plan. And then phase two, I think, is October 25. Right. Uh, is 
there are, I don't know how many phases there are. That's, okay, so the yeah. whole thing should be complete by yeah. 25. I think one of the things that's uh, has impressed me the way that, uh, given the way the market, the housing market is completely broken, uh, the way so many people do manage to uh, move on uh, and to keep going despite that. And I'm thinking just about our Greenwich Bills program, how we brought crystal balls with you this evening, but uh, um, how confident are you we're going to be able to keep going uh, with this, a program of this sort of scale for um, a reasonable length of time? I can also go in, um, right, I think the um, people talked about the, um, you know, this perfect storm that we've been experiencing. I don't know to what extent Brexit is also part of that as you mentioned, actually, the Ukraine war and the impact that's actually had a cost, but I'm not sure whether the um, impact, actually, of the Ukraine war and others um, is still having a massive impact on skills shortages, which is, you know, I think it's just another problem that we've actually got in trying to deliver this programme and delivering it um, on time. What the scale we want. Yeah, so... Uh, aside from the Greenwich builds, the sort of housing new supply and the regeneration, so negotiating with developers, Brexit did have an impact. So uh, Barclay Homes, I'm sure, won't mind me saying that they lost a lot of work, skilled workers overnight. Um, and it's been a struggle to recruit the right skills since. And that's pushed inflation because you've got competition for labour. So that really is a, an issue. The building safety issue, of course, which people have mentioned is part of the perfect storm, bill cost inflation, and I think the uncertainty over the two-stair course is a really, really big one. So I think Michael Gove announced last December that he was dropping the requirement from 30 metres to 18 metres, but he's only last week issued the actual guidance. And so we've had months of developers not knowing what they should design in or not, and all developers having to think about going back into the planning process, which puts pressure on our planning colleagues, um, but going back into the planning process and seeking to amend planning applications to take account of the building safety issues, not really knowing what the solution is that the government is going to regulate. And, and um, so that has been a really, really big issue that's affected supply. In terms of our long-term plan, I think that the challenges for um, councils is this borrowing cap. I think if, if you, if we, this, this is a, a technical point, but it, it's a fundable debt in the sense of if, if, if you're building new homes and you've got rent, you should be able to pay back the debt. But the way the government treats housing borrowing in its fiscal rules is, is that it's a debt that's not funded. So hence why they're so strict about what you can borrow. Now, a change in government might mean a change in those fiscal rules, which would make a big difference because you would be able to raise more against your housing revenue account. You'd be able to borrow more. I think the limitation on us is, is that borrowing level. And there's only so many, I mean, you know, we, we've got, we want to build, but we also can buy. And so we've, you know, we've made big increases on the housing revenue account, but there is a limit to how much capital we're going to be able to, to have. And that's the main barrier. The other big thing, of course, is we can't make up sites. So land, we can't make land. And so we've got to make better use of land. And that's part of the thinking behind the estate renewal process, where on some developments you think, well, we might be able to get more social homes out of it than there were originally. Um, so we'll do some work investigating that um, and that will form part of the business plan going forward. Uh, yes, Councillor Asgar. Uh, Jeremy, I have a final question. Um, another thing this panel has looked at is the strategic asset review. Um, and this was kind of sparked off by Councillor Downs' question about use of um, industrial buildings. So as part of the strategic asset review, if properties are, are 
classed as for disposal or not suited to our needs anymore. Would there be any possibility of looking at those for redevelopment or conversion? Um, for instance, if there was a building that you could, instead of selling it to a, um, a property developer or investor who would turn it into flats and sell it, could we keep the asset, convert it into properties to house our residents? Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. So there are a, num there are a number of assets where that has actually been the case. So there was a former adult services property. One option could be that you sell it. One option is, is that we think about, is it, a, is it a site which would be appropriate for Greenwich Builds? And we are looking at, at it for Greenwich Builds because we think the housing need is so great. And actually, what would we, you know, there's a bit of a cost balancing exercise, isn't there? Cost benefit analysis of what would we get if we sold it in the current market versus what if we kept it in perpetuity? and used it for council housing. Um, it might be different, it might be a different equation on a different site because you might say actually the capital receipt is more important for the council, particularly if it's a general fund asset. Or you might say in some situations, um, let's appropriate, into, appropriate it into the housing revenue account um, and develop it for council homes. Or you might say, let's secure planning permission on the site and sell it and with the value, mean that we have less borrowing requirement and more capital to invest. So those are all the kind of conversations we have when we're looking at those assets. Um, and it is fair to say, you know, we're clear, you know, council housing is so important. And in fact, the early asset review has focused very much on things like premises managers, houses on schools for use as temporary accommodation um, to try and deal with that problem. So, yeah. Thank you. So from a sustainability point of view, wouldn't I'm thinking from a sustainability point of view, is conversion of premises something you actively look at or when you see something, it's like, let's demolish it and build a zero carbon Greenwich build um, development instead? Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah, increasingly we would have to, particularly if we were thinking about estate renewal, we would need to understand what was the embodied carbon in that development at that time, and therefore what would be our position in moving to net zero would be very difficult to achieve. So you would probably look at refurbishment, um, but it does depend because in the case of say Morris Walk, for instance, the houses were in such a terrible state, any amount of refurbishment wouldn't, it would have been like putting lipstick on a pig. It just wouldn't have worked because the, the structural integrity of those properties were just were wrong. But yes, of course, you, you know, in, in some cases you would look at infill and you would look at refurb before you would look at redevelopment. Um, great. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it was really, really helpful. Just the wording of the recommendation that I wrote down, I just want to check that it works. Um, to recommend that when new Greenwich build sites are commissioned, regeneration liaise with repairs to see if improvements to other stock in the vicinity can be undertaken in a similar time frame. Perfect. Thanks. I'll pass that on to you, Raymond. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Final item on the agenda is just work programme discussion for the next municipal year. So just a reminder to please send any suggestions for the next work programme um, to me. And unless there's any other business, we can close the meeting there. Thank you all very much.